Hello and welcome to Lecture 20. I'm Chris Mack and this is From Data to Decisions. In this lecture I'm going to show in Excel and in R some outlier identification and testing procedures. First in Excel. Remember that detecting and figuring out what to do with an outlier is not something we do on its own but something we do as a part of trying to understand the distribution of our data. So we generally begin by plotting the data. So let's go back to this uh, first uh, tab in our spreadsheet, the QQ plot. Uh, the QQ plot and the histogram. So I plot a histogram over here, and I look at it and say, eh, well, maybe it's kind of normal. I see some bumps out here. Small, a indication of heavy tails. You know, it's really hard to tell a whole lot from a histogram. But when I look at the QQ plot here, I see a characteristic shape to the QQ plot that tells me heavy tails. And in between, it's sort of straight. Uh, so the middle part of the distribution might be normal or close to normal, but the tails look a little heavy. Right? When I go and do my moment testing, call from uh, uh, previous lectures, we did moment testing on the same data set. We found out that Skeena's perspective is kind of borderline, whether we could describe it as, as being normal or we would reject the null hypothesis that the data is normal. But as soon as we looked at the kurtosis, we found that the kurtosis was uh, a long ways away from uh, being uh, a normal distribution. In fact, uh, the Z value was 20. That is, the amount of kurtosis we see is about 20 standard deviations away from the mean of what we'd expect if this were to happen just by random chance. The p-value is zero. <coughs> Obviously, you have heavy tails. Now, the question, though, when you just do these tests, is what is causing that? Is it is it just that we have heavy tails, or is it that we have some bad data point outlier? So let's supplement what we've done so far, so far with an outlier test. All right, so I have the same data. This is all the same data that we've been working with so far, the Ambler and Jones uh, NBS data of uh, 100 measurements of a nominally 10 gram weight, mean, variance, etc. Then let's take this data and perform some initial looks. One initial look is to use the IQR method of labeling data points as being outliers or not. So first the IQR. In Excel we use the quartile function shown here. You can have the third quartile and the first quartile by doing three and one. And here the interquartile range, the difference between the third and the first quartile is six, six milligrams. <clears throat> we then can calculate an upper and lower limit to label uh, outliers uh, by using the third quartile plus one and a half times the interquartile range as the upper limit and the th first quartile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range as the lower limit. Uh, that puts an upper limit at 416, lower limit at 392. I have my data sorted from smallest to largest to make it easier to identify. And 392 is right here at the second to the first data point. Uh, and the smallest data point is 375, which is beyond that limit. So Using this method, we would identify that data point as a potential outlier worthy of investigation. We can also look for far outliers, where instead of using 1.5 times the interquartile range, we'll use three times the interquartile range. And that gives an upper limit of, of 425 and a lower limit of 383. And using this far outlier criteria, we see that 375, that data point, is still labeled by the IQR method as an outlier. Uh, remember the upper limit, 416 and 425. If I go all the way to the maximum data points, we see that uh, with 416, we have three potential outliers labeled. And with 425, we have one, the most extreme value. So by the IQR method, we have two outliers, one on either side of the mean which is why we're, we're not failing the skewness test. If we only had one outlier on one side of the mean, failing the skewness test, but we are failing the sales test, the kurtosis test. 
So let's use the Dixon Q test on one or two of these outliers. Remember the Dixon Q test says, what is the difference between the farthest, the extreme data point and its nearest neighbor, divided by the total range? Uh, that is, is sometimes called R10. There's in fact a number of potential Dixon uh, metrics we can test, but this is the simplest one. So I'm not giving you a complete description of everything you can do with the Dixon Q test. But here we're, we're looking at the difference between these two data points compared to the total range. That's Q1 and then Q100. Excuse me. Q100 is the distance between the extreme value on the large side and its nearest neighbor divided by the range. And you see the Q values are 0.27 and 0.22. The critical Q, which we get from the table, uh, which is provided in the in the uh, lectures, lecture notes, uh, has alpha of 0.01 at an alpha of 0.01, a significance level of 0.01, which is the kind of significance level you might use if you're planning to use 0.05 for all of your other statistical tests with this data. Uh, we see that the critical value is 0.74, which would label the largest data point not as an outlier, and the next data point, smallest one, as well, right on the borderline. So the Dixon Q test says, really, you don't have any outliers. The problem is what we discussed in class, though. It's masking, especially at this uh, Q100, meaning the 100th data point. It's being masked by the fact that there's also a potential outlier right next to it. But the distance between these two data points is not so great. All right, but our, our main test we're going to use is the Grubbs test. The Grubbs test uh, takes uh, the, an extreme value and studentizes it. So I'll take um, B5 here is the, the smallest value, subtract it. Uh, excuse me, B9 is the smallest value. B5 is the average mean value of all the data right here. And so I'm subtracting the smallest value from the mean dividing by the standard deviation. And that gives me a studentized value. So we see that the first data point is four and a half standard deviations away from the mean. The largest data point, Tn, is five standard deviations away from the mean. And the critical T value is 3.7. So we see that at a significance level of 0.01, we see that both of these values are greater than the critical T value, we would say that testing each outlier one at a time, that they're both outliers. But you should probably test them both at the same time. So another way to, to do this is with the uh, sum of square errors ratio. Remember, we take the data out and then calculate the sum of squares errors and divide that by the sum of square errors where the, the data is left in data being the, the point that we might consider as an outlier. So I made a couple of columns over here where I took away the smallest outlier, this column C. Column D, I took away the largest outlier. And in column E, I took both the smallest and the largest data point away. And that allowed me to calculate the sum of square errors, or the sum of square errors with the data points removed to the sum of square errors with the data present. And that ratio here, here, and here can be compared to a critical value, again, from that table that I've provided on my website. So if you have only one outlier, whether it's an outlier uh, above or below the mean, and alpha of 0.01 and 100 data points, the Critical ratio is 0.858, and if I'm trying to remove two outliers, one above and one below the mean, then the critical ratio is 0.791, both of these numbers from those tables. And we see that all of these metrics are beyond that critical ratio. Another way of, of doing the Grubbs test is to calculate the critical T value rather than looking it up. And so this formula, I got from the NIST website uh, that I've referenced, and also it's 
in my class notes in the PowerPoint slides. This formula allows you to calculate the critical T value you can use to compare. Now, very, very quick note. This is a very small issue, but whenever you use the standard deviation, you need to be careful to figure out which standard deviation you want to use. In Excel, you have a stdev.p and .s. .p means population, which means you take the sum of square errors and divide by n. If you use .s, you're dividing by n minus 1. That's the sample version of the standard deviation formula. Which should you use the Grubbs t-test? Now, Grubbs' original paper from 1950 and the tables that he generated with that used a, a dot p, that is, they divided by n rather than n minus 1. However, later he switched in his 1969 paper to, to using the more conventional sample standard deviation formula dividing by n minus 1. And when we calculate the critical t value using this formula, we're using n minus 1 for our standard deviation calculation. So uh, we need to switch this to dot s when we want to use the calculated t value from this equation to compare against. Now, the difference is going to be very, very small unless you have only a few data points. If you have only a few data points, then probably you're not going to be worrying about statistical tests for outliers. Uh, if it fails with the dividing by n minus 1 and it doesn't fail by dividing by n, well, then you're too close to the critical value to probably make a decision anyways. Bottom line, doesn't really matter. Matter that much whether you use n or n minus one, uh, unless you want to compare your answers to somebody else's answers, then you want to be consistent about what you're doing. Okay, last point is Chauvinet's criterion. This is not a re recommended approach. It's very commonly used by uh, uh, people in some branches of science, but it's not really a statistically valid test. Uh, it sets an alpha. A, a, critical value of 1 over 2 times n. And then you can calculate, assuming a normal distribution, uh, an upper critical value and a lower critical value. And in this case, these upper and lower critical values are not terribly different than the far IQR outlier values. But of course, that's not always going to be the case. Um, in any case, uh, I don't really recommend using Chauvinet's criterion. I just included it. For completeness. All right, that's some uh, testing of outliers in Excel. Let's do the same thing in R. So I have a script outliers demo.r, which is available on the website. And we can run the script to do all the same things. Uh, remember that I've got a couple of libraries. This first one with the very intuitive name E1071 is used for skewness testing. So I'll Load that library, control R loads it. And then Outliers is a library which you have to install the package the first time you use it. And from then on, you can just load the library. Got the Grubbs test. Here I list uh, the basic steps that we're going to go through. First, you graph the data to get an impression of what's going on. If you think that the underlying distribution potentially is a normal distribution, you want to check that. You can run the skewness and kurtosis tests and possibly the Grubbs test on those things you might identify as outliers. All right, so let's read in the data. It's the exact same data we saw before. Uh, we're going to generate some graphs. Here's a histogram of those data points. Uh, notice how easy it is to get these graphs up. This is one of the values of R. Is, uh, it is really, really fun and easy to generate a very quick plot and see what's going on. Uh, histograms in Excel are not nearly as easy to generate. Here's the box plot. Again, the box plot's virtually impossible to generate in Excel, um, but it has the same three outliers on the, the big side and one outlier on the bottom side labeled as outliers using the 1.5 times IQR method. But most valuable plot is going to be the QQ plot. 
So generate that QQ plot as we've seen before. It's pretty straight, but then has these tails that are a little bit heavy. All right, we're going to run through the skewness tests. We did this last time, so in fact, I'm going to skip them. But we would do the skewness tests, and we get all the same results that we had before. Now I'm going to run the grubs test. And this grubs.test command uh, takes as its input a, a, a univariate set of data. In this case, weights uh, dollar sign result, the result column in, in the weights data. Uh, and then there's a type, 1.0. The type in the comment I wrote below says, type 1.0 is a test for one outlier on whichever side is the most extreme compared to the mean. So 1.0 means there's one outlier on, on one side and zero outliers on the other side. Right? So let's run that test. It will find the most extreme value and then test it as an outlier. Results are shown here on the bottom. Uh, it calculates what they call the G value for grubs, but in, in my lecture, I called it the T value. It's 5.0117. Hey, for fun, let's go back to Excel. 5.0117, exact same number using the dot S standard deviation. All right. Then we've got a P value of 3 times 10 to the minus 6. Uh, which is below whatever critical value you might pick. So alternative hypothesis that the highest value, 37, is an outlier, uh, we would reject the null hypothesis that it's not. You could also test the extreme value on the other side. So if you say type 1.0, but then you say opposite equals true, instead of going to the side with the most extreme value, it goes to the opposite side of the most extreme value and then test that extreme value. In this case, it would test the smallest data point. Oh, what did I do? I didn't do the opposite here. Let's do this there. I, I went to the wrong line. Uh, so we say G value is 4.576. Again, I'll quickly jump back. Yeah, 4.5756, same thing as I got in Excel. P value, 6 times 10 to the minus 5. Alternative hypothesis, the lowest value, 375, is an outlier. Check the null hypothesis in favor of this alternate hypothesis. Uh, another type of test is type 1.1. One, one. It's a test for two outliers, one on each side of the mean. So if I run that, uh, it's the Grubbs test for two opposite outliers, and it shows a G value of 10 almost. So 10 standard deviations away from the mean. Sure enough, the P value is extremely small, and we, we will reject in favor of our, our alternative hypothesis that both of these values are outliers. There's another test, type 2.0. This looks for two outliers on one side. Unfortunately, it's limited to only uh, 30 data points or less. So not very useful to have more data points. All right, that's our Grubbs test in Excel, excuse me, in R, which as you can see gives us the same values as when we do them in Excel, but it's actually quite a bit easier to do them in R. And that's my lecture demo. Thanks, until next time.